Hello, and thank you for joining me on According to John. I am your host, John Westfall. As we open up the podcast today, we're going to learn a little bit about what God wants us to know. We're going to get to look into a mirror, if you will. We're going to see what type of builder we are. Do we build our house on the sand? Do we build our house on the rock? Do we trust in Jesus? Do we hear what he's got to say and follow it? A lot of questions and a short time to get it done, so let's jump right to it. We're going to be opening our Bibles today to Matthew seven twenty four through 27. It says this, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So this is a parable. We know it's a parable because Jesus gives us a truth, but there's no names, there's no names of people, no names of places. If there are names, then it's not a parable, it's an actual event that has happened. And so here we're getting wisdom uh, from God and uh, are from Jesus very specifically, parable of the wise and the foolish builders. And uh, Jesus is just giving us this to illustrate the difference between those who hear and act upon what they've learned from Jesus and those who hear but do not act upon what they have learned. And so in context, uh, Jesus has just finished teaching many things to the crowds. Uh, And then he says, uh, hey, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet... You don't do what I've told you to do. Uh, then we find that in Luke six forty six. But then Jesus also says, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, but only those who does the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus then tells this parable and the wise and foolish builders. Now, according to Jesus, the man who hears his words, listens to them. You know, so many people today, uh, they they hear what you're saying, but they don't listen. And so they really don't understand what's going on or what's expected of them. And so Jesus just simply says, hey, for the one who hears uh, his words and, and acts upon them uh, is like a man who uh, literally dug deep into the ground, lays the foundation on rock, on, on uh, that which will not get washed away when he's building a house. And same way with today, nobody would dare build a beautiful house without building and digging the foundation and pouring the footers and then building the house on it. And they find solid ground to build it on. So now a great storm comes with rain, floods, strong winds. This, this house literally is built out on a ground. It's not built on the, on the beach, if you will, uh, but it's built on the rock. It's solid. It's not going anywhere when the, when the winds blow and, and the rains come and it doesn't wash the, the underneath. If you've ever stood on the beach and felt the sand uh, underneath your feet when a wave comes, and then it's almost like the sand just kind of, uh, the, the wave takes the sand right out from underneath your feet, and, and you feel yourself go down a little bit. That's literally what he's talking about here when the waves and the rain come, because uh, certain times of the year, the rains would come. Uh, prior to that, it would be a solid area. There wouldn't be no rain, no mud, nothing, uh, because the rains were seasonal. So they would build their house in that area, and then when the seasonal rains came, uh, I don't know, maybe the people thought they were going to get away with it. Maybe maybe they thought, hey, I know the rains come this time of the year, but it's not going to get us. We're going we're gonna to build it right here, and, and the rains will miss us. And so then they build it, only to find out You can't build a house without building it on a solid foundation. And so then Jesus says uh, to the one who hears his words and does not act upon them, he is like the man who builds his house without a foundation, and the wind and the rain came and destroyed it because there there was nothing there for it to stand on. Well, Jesus is teaching his audience that those who hear and act on his teachings to obey God are wise. However, those who hear and continue to disobey, they are the foolish people. His explanation for why is stated prior to this parable that we have to go back and look. And he says in, in Matthew seven twenty four 
21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have not prophesied, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I would de- declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Uh, this fact is true because we show what we truly believe by what we do. Listen, our actions will always reveal the truth. There is no hiding it. We can't get away from it. Uh, For a short time, maybe. Maybe for a little while we can live a certain way and act and talk a certain way, and that'll fool some of the people. We'll get somewhere with that. But, But the reality is our actions are the manifestation of what's really happening inside of us, which means that, Our actions reveal what is true about us, what we believe, who we serve, who we love, and it's only a matter of time before people will see that. It's only a matter of time before the real you will come out. If we say that we believe in something, our actions can contradict us to reveal what we truly believe. If we say we love someone more than ourselves, guess what? Our actions will reveal uh, that we love someone more than ourselves. It will reveal the truth of it. What we do shows who we really serve, who we love the most, and what we really think. If we ever need proof of what is true about ourselves, uh, all, all we can do is look at our actions. Others will look at our actions. Now, Someone is always going to know the truth about you. If you say you love Jesus, but you never go to church, the the question remains, do you love Jesus? You say you love Jesus, but you live more uh, for yourself and more to do what you want to do, and you don't follow what God says. Do you really love Jesus? There's, there, there are some things that happen that will truly expose us and tell us and tell others what we believe. And then, of course, we can always deny that, and we can we can lie to ourselves, but it doesn't uh, stop the truth because the reality is truth is not dependent upon us. Truth is truth regardless of what we believe. James and Paul both make it clear that our actions reveal the truth about what we believe. James says uh, in, in James 2, 17 through 18, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Listen, what he's saying here is is works aren't what gives you faith. I mean, you, you don't go to heaven because you worked for it. Uh, what, it what he's saying here is, do you want to see what I believe? Watch what I do. You, you, you want to see uh, who I love? Watch who, where I spend my time. You, you want to learn something about me? Look at my calendar and pay attention to those I hang out with, and you pay attention to what I do, and my works will show you my faith. James 2.26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. If you say you believe but you don't do do you really believe? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you, if you love me, you're going to do what I've asked you to do. And so again, our actions reveal the truth, what we truly believe. In the context of Titus 1.16, Paul is speaking of false teachers, and he says this, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. And so, so Paul is, is clearly speaking of false teachers and how they talk with their mouth, but their body or their actions say otherwise. So many times growing up, we were told, don't do as I do, do as I say. Well, if you pay attention to what they do, it tells you if they really believe what they say. If they really believe it, they're going to live it out. They're not just going to expect someone else to live it out and then they not live it out themselves. 
So these people likely had themselves convinced that they did know God, but their actions, they denied him. And Paul is claiming, again, that actions reveals truth. Paul was also someone who thought he was serving God when he initially persecuted Christians. And, of course, what we later find out and what Paul finds out later is his actions literally were, they were opposing God. In Acts 9, 5, we find this out. This is on the road to Damascus, and many know that event. And it says here that Paul asked, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads or the pricks. Uh, and, and what that was, was literally it would be a, a fork, if you will, that was split, and they would use it to jab the cattle into the, uh, into the Achilles or that, that tender spot behind the ankle. And, uh, and that would get them going. And, of course, when you would poke them there, their instinct would be to kick, and it would just hurt them even more so they would get moving. And when Jesus says in Acts 9, 5, uh, it's hard for you to kick against the goads, that's, that's what he's referencing. And then Jesus explains in 16, John 16, 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And so he's, he's again explaining in John 16, 2, that listen, just because you think you're doing God's work, you are not doing God's work. And so these people will think that they know God and that they're serving God, but in reality, they're opposing him uh, with what they do, with their actions. And so realizing that our actions reveal the truth about what we truly believe is essential to understanding faith and repentance. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we didn't, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus himself makes it clear that our actions truly reveal what we believe. And Jesus claims that the only people who will be saved are those who obey God's will. Now, again, this isn't because that they did good works, but it's because they lived out what they believe. And there are people who will say, Lord, Lord, but their evil deeds, their evil actions, uh, that which they live out day in and day out will mark them as evildoers and reveal that Jesus is not their Lord. You can't say Jesus is my Lord and Savior and then go live the life that you want to live. That The Bible is very clear that you, you cannot. Listen, the Bible says uh, fornication is a sin. Do not do it. But yet we have people who they are living together, they are sexually active together, they are fulfilling the uh, lust of the flesh outside of marriage, and that completely goes against what God says to do. That alone says your, your actions are, are contradicting you saying, I love Jesus, because Jesus again says in John 14, 6, if you love me, keep, you'll keep my commandments. And so people will lie. And then they'll say, well, I didn't have a, I didn't have a choice. I, I had to lie. Well, they didn't have to lie. They had a choice. And the reason most people lie is to protect themselves. And now they'll say that they're doing it to protect others. But the reality is they're protecting themselves. And so we see evil actions mark them as evildoers and reveal that Jesus is not their Lord. Many may think they believe in Jesus Christ, but again, their actions reveal that they do not believe in him, nor do they know him. And so our actions will reveal the truth of who we really serve. According to Jesus, no, man, no, no slave can serve two masters. This is in, in Luke uh, 16, 13, and in, in Matthew 6, 24, it says, 
No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or God and money, God and wealth. That's, that's what it's talking about. And yet so often today, that's exactly what moves people and, and runs people's lives is money. Got to have money. Got to have finances. Uh, Got to have the big things, nice things. And, and, and I find it interesting. So many people say, well, well, I'm working to give my kids a better life, but yet you never see your children. And the reality is the better life to your children is you. And so here Jesus speaks specifically of God and wealth, but because the foundation of all sin is selfishness, we are really either serving God or ourselves. Jesus explains that no one when tempted should say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one, but one is tempted by one's own desires, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. We read that in James. Chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. It is serving ourselves and being tempted by one's own desire that causes us to uh, fulfill the lust of the flesh, uh, to give in to that which we should not, to do that which we should not do, and ultimately disobey God. And, of course, Paul explains in Romans six fifteen through 18, that we are either slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. He says here in 6, 15 through 18, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. I mean, listen, Paul gets pretty emphatic about this. He's like, certainly not. We shall not sin uh, because we're not under the law and that we're under grace and under uh, the law says don't do it. You'll be punished. Grace says Uh, You're forgiven. So does that give us a license to sin? Absolutely not. Paul gets a little excited here. And then in verse 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? And then he goes on, "But, but God be thanked. That though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And so literally what he's saying in 17, but God be thanked that we heard the word that Jesus Christ saves. We surrendered to that word and that we are delivered and we've been set free from sin, and we became slaves to that which God would have us to do, and that is righteousness, or to live righteously. Paul also compares sin to righteousness, explaining that we are slaves of the one whom you obey. Romans 2.8, But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. As we look at this, then he goes on in verse 10, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who who works what is good. And so we see here we are obeying either ourselves. And in other words, we are our own God, and so therefore we, we obey us and we fulfill uh, the lust of the flesh. Or we obey God. For those who are self-seeking and who obey not the truth but wickedness. That means you obey yourself, not God. There will be wrath and fury. That's Romans 2.8. John also makes it clear that the separation between the righteous and unrighteous is by what they do. Our actions reveal the truth about who we serve. I love how John, 1 John 3, 7 through 10 puts it. Little children, 
Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous, he being God. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He goes on in verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is he who does not love his brother. And so, so we go back to verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin. Uh, literally, it would read, whoever has been born of God does not sin on a continuous basis. And so, so it's not that, that you don't sin because the, the reality is you, you could sin. You could make a decision and do what you want to do and, and not serve God and, and throw God to the side. Uh, but here he says, whoever has been born of God does not sin on a regular basis or make it a practice to sin regularly. Jesus Christ modeled uh, obeying God over ourselves, as Paul explains in Philippians 2.8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So as we look at Jesus and how Jesus modeled it, and I know so many people say, well, Jesus was God. It was easy for him. He couldn't sin or he didn't want to sin. Uh, I'm not God. I'm human, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's real easy to go on and say that. But the reality is he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient. You know, Guys, that's, that's what we need to do. If, if we're going to build our house on the rock, if we're going to be one of the two builders, either, either to build our house as a wise man does or build our house as a foolish man does, uh, this is going to be the beginning right here. That as a man, whether man, woman, or child, as a, as a human being, that we humble ourselves and that we become obedient to Christ, to God the Father, even to the point of death. And then then if you say, I love Jesus, it's going to show in the stand that you take. People people are going to look and go, yeah, he definitely loves God. He definitely loves Jesus. When Jesus was about to be crucified, he is recorded as saying to the Father in Matthew 26, 39, not, not what I want, but what you want. Jesus' actions revealed the truth about who he served. He served God the Father. All throughout scriptures we find where Jesus says, uh, I'm, I'm here for my Father. I listen to my Father. I do what my Father says. I'm honoring my Father. All throughout scripture. Because he lived it out, and so therefore what he said was truth. However, Paul has explained in Philippians 2, uh, 6 through 7, he says, though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. Jesus sacrificed everything because he loved the Father. And his actions revealed that truth. And our actions will reveal the truth of who we love. John explains it in 1 John 5, 3 through 4, for the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. The reality is, if we are obedient to God, we're obedient to what the Father wants, and we're born again, according to John chapter 3, whatever is born of God conquers the world. We win. If we fail to obey God's commandments, then we reveal 
that we do not love God. If we love God above ourselves, then his commandments would not be a problem because we obey the one we love. And so if God tells us to do something, we say, yes, Lord. Why? Because it is our desire to honor him, not ourselves. Jesus says it beautifully in Luke 16, 13. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. And, of course, he's talking about God and wealth. Listen, he will either love God so much that wealth is just a thing or he will love wealth so much that God will get in the way. The two greatest commandments are to love God above all and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And if we ever get that out of perspective, our life will show it. We'll be unkind and we'll be disobedient. So this is a commandment to change the hierarchy of our love, replacing loving ourselves first for loving God first, with ourselves and others as a tie for second. I mean, you have to love yourself to love others. You have to think of yourselves so that we can share that with others. But we can't put ourselves above God. James 1, 13 through 15. If we sin, it reveals that we love ourselves more than God since sin is a self-seeking act. It's all about us. If our sin is something that could hurt someone else, being adultery, murder, stealing, lying, then it also means that we love ourselves more than that person. Otherwise, if you love that person more than yourself or even equal, then you would not sin against that person or you would not be able to commit the sin because you would be loving them more than yourself. When God first gave his commandments in the Old Testament, it is explained this way. You shall not act as we are acting here today, all of us according to our own desires. That's Deuteronomy 12, 8. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Boy, we've got that backwards today. People say, it's my life, I can do what I want. Well, it's your life, but there's sure enough a price for doing whatever you want. Also in Deuteronomy 19.9, it is written, And if you keep all these commandments and do them, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to walk always in his ways, I find it very interesting that, man, listen, if you keep God's commands, you do what God asked you to do, you, and, and you live it out. You don't, just, you don't just talk it, but you live it. God says that he will bless you. And listen, this isn't prosperity teaching it is simply that god will bless you however that looks and that's not to say god's going to bless you with finances that's not to say god's going to bless you with big homes fancy cars uh or the best job in the world but what it does say is that god will take care of you in a great way loving god first is what causes us to obey him when we disobey him that's loving ourselves first Sin, which is disobedience to God. Many times I've heard it missing the mark of God. But sin literally is doing what you want rather than what God says. It's disobedience. Sin is self-seeking. Romans 2, 8. James 1, 13 uh, through 15 also tells us that sin is self-seeking. 13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed listen we are tempted when we see something that we want and of course satan's going to use it to draw us toward him but either way we are tempted we are drawn in and we become disobedient to god listen let's be honest sin is fantastic for a season there's a lot of fun in sin but then there's just that day when it comes and it costs us far more than we ever anticipated. It takes us down a road that we 
plan on or didn't calculate on. Or or maybe we thought, oh, we're smarter than uh, Joe next door and we can get away with it. And I just want you to know uh, you can't get away with it when it comes to God. So when Jesus speaks of salvation, which is is what we have to have in order to serve God first. That literally means when, when, when he speaks of salvation, it's clearly, clear, clearly meaning that we deny ourselves, praise the Father by loving Jesus, loving the Father, and keeping his commandments. Matthew ten thirty eight says, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Then Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny ourselves and follow Jesus. For some reason, that gets very difficult at times. And and the only reason it gets difficult at times is because we look in the mirror too long and think we deserve too much. And Jesus clearly, bluntly says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whether we deny ourselves or not reveals our love for Jesus, or at least if Jesus is first in our life. The, the idea of denying ourselves means that we are placing the love of ourselves below our love for Jesus. John explains in 1 John 2, 3 through 6, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, God's word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him, being Jesus, ought himself also to walk just as Jesus walked. When John speaks of obeying God's commandments, he is making it clear, avoiding any confusion by saying, whoever says I abide in him ought to walk just as Jesus walked. That means that you do everything that God says. You live a sinless life. You have reached perfection. And I'm going to just gamble and say nobody has reached that yet, so I think we have something to keep striving for. John, 1 John 5, 4 through 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is? is the Son of God. So according to these verses, true faith is what motivates us to be obedient to God. Making obedience or disobedience to God the factor that reveals what we truly believe or who we serve and who we love first. So if we sin occasionally, it means that we love God until it collides with our own strong desires. Essentially, we love God as long as it does not cause us any serious discomfort, uh, displeasure, or inconvenience. It, it is, we love God when it's convenient. We love God when it doesn't cost us anything. I find it interesting that when you tell someone they're living in sin, the first thing they say is, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. But yet, God says that we can see who loves him by watching them, listening to them. And so I want to just remind you, each and every one of us has to know, as long as we are feeding our own desires, living for for our own pleasures, uh, we're not loving God. 
So our actions reveal if we truly believe God, Jesus, the Bible. Our actions reveal the truth through our obedience. Are, are we obedient to what the Bible says, or do we fulfill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life? And then our actions reveal who we really love. By what we do says who we love. And so to say you love Jesus and yet do that which disappoints him, that's not loving Jesus. To say that that we love Jesus or we love God and then we are continuously living in disobedience, that, that's, not, that's not loving God. And so then it really questions or begs the answer to the question, do you have faith? Do you really believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, that he really gave his life on the cross, that he is the Savior of the world and that he is your Savior? If he is, then obedience is a must. And love is a direct result, or I should say obedience is a direct result of your love. And your actions will reveal that. I hope this has helped everyone or someone. I hope that it has caused us to look at ourselves, to ask some strong questions, to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, do we love God? Does my life exemplify that? Am I obedient? Or is my faith a worthless faith? So many questions that only we can answer on a personal level by what we do what we say, how we act. Maybe you would be willing to take the challenge and ask a friend or a loved one, hey, when you see me, do I remind you of Jesus? Hey, God bless you. This has been According to John with your host, John Westfall. I hope you like, subscribe, and follow. There'll be more to come. (laughs) 